Where is the government allowed to ban the possession and carry of firearms? We know that there are some places at one end of the spectrum where they cannot ban it. We know there are some other places at the other end of the spectrum where they can ban it. And when I say government, I'm talking federal, state, municipal, everything. That's what we're going to be looking at here today. We're going to be giving you the constitutional tests and the cases that you need to know so that you can win imaginary internet points arguing online, as well as with that uncle at the holidays. My name is Tom Grieve. I'm a former state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Let's get into it. So we're talking about the law of sensitive locations. That's where the U.S. Supreme Court in the Bruin decision came out and said, look, there are some places where the government may regulate the possession and carry of firearms, and by regulate, I mean effectively ban. But the government also made it clear that, look, you just cannot ban them everywhere. They have to be in certain reasons, certain places, all that kind of stuff. We're going to be getting into that in a moment. But of course, for those of you who are brand new, let's just quickly cover what the talking points are. The anti-Second Amendment talking points are basically goes like this, and so too does the legal strategy of, look, we have to ban firearms in basically any places where there's groups of people, uh, because we need to protect people, we need to protect all that kind of stuff. So basically, the anti-Second Amendment talking points leads them to a, a legislative position, as we've seen play out in many states, New York, just going on and on and on, where they say, look, public property, can't do that. So any government property, instantly out, jail, straight to jail. We also talk about the fact of any place, again, where public may gather, whether that's sporting venues, whether that's shopping, retail, all that kind of stuff, because after all, we need to protect people. As a result, we are only left with, in essence, certain private property, because again, we're banning commercial areas, all that kind of stuff. And private property, by the way, we're also going to say, you know what, in order to have a firearm at private property, you either need to fit one or two criteria, either criteria number one, let's say you go to a buddy's house, that friend must explicitly allow you to bring firearms onto their property. So there's an there's an opt-in. The anti-Second Amendment crowd is saying, nope, cannot possess firearms, period, on private property unless there's an opt-in. There's a second category where in certain places like firearm ranges, gun stores, so forth, where they say, look, you may not need to get explicit permission there. That's basically the anti-Second Amendment strategy. That's the perspective on this. The pro-Second Amendment strategy is really simple. It's shall not be infringed. Here's what the Supreme Court said in the Bruin decision. That's B-R-U-E-N. We're not talking about the Boston Bruins. We're talking about the Supreme Court Bruin decision. What the Bruin decision said is that when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. The government must then justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition. A lot of legalese going on there. Let's translate this into English in three easy steps. Number one, and again, we're trying to figure out if a law or regulation the government has passed, whether or not it's going to be protected by the Second Amendment, and how does this all work? What does the test look like? Number one, first, does the regulated conduct fall within the text of the Second Amendment? Okay, so are we dealing with people possessing firearms and just basically that's it, possessing firearms. Uh, because of course, in order to possess something, you need a place and a time to possess the something. So everything else kind of wraps around that. Number two, if the regulation does deal with the Second Amendment protected issue, then is there historical support for the conduct being regulated? In other words, is this a brand new executive fiat, administrative fiat? Is this a brand new law that's been passed where there's no historical tradition? Okay. Well, in order to determine whether or not it does fall in or outside of historical tradition or analysis, we move to step three. To win and keep the law as being constitutional, the government must justify its regulations by demonstrating that the regulation is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Again, very briefly, number one, does it fall within the Second Amendment? Number two, is there any historical support at all? And number three, if you can make some sort of case for historical support, it's the government that bears the burden of proof, not the citizen, the government that bears the burden of proof to justify that the regulations fall within the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. But of course, there's lots of questions there. What constitutes historical tradition? Does historical tradition start at the year 1800 or the year 2000? Broadly, Supreme Court has basically said, look, kind of 1800s and back, probably we're going to be okay, but they also gave a very strict caveat that not all history is created equal. In other words, good luck anti-Second Amendment people trying to use laws that, for instance, 
disarmed Catholics, disarmed free slaves, disarmed slaves as being, you know what, that's good constitutional law. Let's keep that. Let's bring that in. Uh, I think that's uh, that's basically a dare by the U.S. Supreme Court to try doing that. So what are the sensitive places that we're actually talking about? Because the U.S. Supreme Court absolutely did say there's three categories that, you know what, this is going to be okay. You can regulate and forbid firearms from coming in here. Before I get into this, really quickly, guys, and I promise this is going to be fast, if you're new here, please show your support for the Second Amendment as well as this channel by clicking like, Click subscribe. It helps us grow. It lets us know that you like what we're doing and you want to see more. It also helps to empower us to make more for you. So thank you very much. Also, as we go along, I'd love to see your comments in the comment field because I love seeing feedback. I interact a lot with folks in the comment box. I think uh, those of you who are not new here probably know that. All right, so onwards we go. So the U.S. Supreme Court basically said that, look, there are three canonical categories where, look, this is going to be okay to make it a gun-free zone. And in their words, these are simply obvious, undisputed, and uncontroversial. Again, their words. Number one, certain government buildings. And I really have to emphasize their word choice of the word certain because they could have said all and they didn't. They said certain. And then they further qualified it by saying such as legislative assemblies or courthouses or where the government is acting within the heartland of its authority. The heartland of its authority. Okay, so legislative assemblies, so state capitals, that kind of stuff, that's out. Or at least certain sections at a minimum where the legislative branch is in session, that's out. Courthouses, got it, reasonably makes sense. I understand certain municipal courts, if you go to like your local town or village, particularly if you live more in the suburbs, more rural area, oftentimes there will be... Uh, a church or some facility which is not a full-time courthouse, so you've got to check your local regulations there. And of course, I'm sure there's going to be legislation and lawsuits on this. But then lastly, we get to the where the government is acting within its heartland of its authority. Okay, is that a library? Is that a bus stop? Because that's all government property. But when you think of the U.S. government, is the heartland of its authority the local DMV? Is the heartland of its authority the local bus stop? Is it the local interstate or road? You can see that that might be kind of difficult to get through. But back to those three categories. So number one, certain government buildings. Number two, polling places. Same qualification before the municipal courts. Not all buildings where, of course, voting takes place are permanently 24-7, 365 polling places. So again, issues that's gonna, that are going to be fought about. Number three, schools. I understand that for folks who go to particularly parochial schools, so a religious-based school, sometimes you have the school as a particular wing of the facility, and then you have the place of worship, which might be separate. So does that mean that the entire thing is now a school? What if they're on different tax keys? They probably aren't, but if they are, what happens if the school uses the general purpose room, which is part of the church, or if they use the place of worship, maybe if it's if it's uh, a Catholic school, maybe the students go to mass a few times during the week. So does that mean that the sanctuary uh, in the church is now part of the school 24-7, 365? Again, all things to be thinking about, all things we're going to be looking at. So those are the three canonical categories that the U.S. Supreme Court said are, in essence, undisputed and uncontroversial. Certain government buildings, polling places, and schools. But then they opened up this door, and the U.S. Supreme Court said that, look, other places may also, of course, be prohibited. And I say, of course, because I'm paraphrasing the U.S. Supreme Court. The question is to whether or not they're going to be prohibited and therefore basically part of the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation is whether or not it's analogous enough to one of those sensitive locations. What do I mean by analogous enough? Well, good thing we're doing a video and we're going through this together, right? As we get through this, I think, and I, I struggled a bit to try to classify when you think of all the different places that are out there, excluding homes, places of dwelling, right? Um, how do we kind of break down property in different areas to try to wrap our arms around this? So what kind of categories are out there? And I think you kind of have recreation. So we're dealing with beaches, movie theaters, sporting concert venues, amusement parks, um, where that's that kind of stuff. Things that tend to be privately owned, not necessarily, but privately owned. We're dealing with places of commerce. So we're talking stores, shops, restaurants, uh, including those that may serve alcohol. We're talking about medical and spiritual. 
So hospitals, urgent cares, clinics, emergency rooms, places of worship, all this kind of stuff. And then government buildings. We're talking airports, libraries, parks, forests, uh, government property in general. So uh, national forests, just all that. Okay. So I think that's kind of four canonical categories. I want to introduce that there because I may be coming back to this in a later video. But as you work through these, so let's, for instance, take a... Uh, something that was recently litigated. So let's, for instance, take a playground. So there was a recent court that said, look, playground is close enough to a school that it falls within the same sphere, to use that court's wording, the same sphere as a school. So that particular court recently said, look, I'm going to allow this. I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to call it a ball and I'm going to say, look, nope, you're, you're, th that's fine. It's outside the strike zone of the second amendment. So you can regulate that. The same court also struck down beaches, movie theaters, sporting events, concerts, all this other kind of stuff. Guys, I really need to remind you here, of course, we're talking about the government regulation. So that doesn't mean that private property posters if you own a movie theater, if you own a sporting or a music concert, those people can still, subject to local listings, subject to local law, they can still post it as being prohibited under the state's private property issues, okay? But we're talking about government restrictions, all right? So that's what we're talking about here. So that's that's basically it, is, as we kind of can do your own analysis of working through, well, okay, is there a historical tradition of uh, regulating restaurants or regulating stores, things like that, right? And again, I, I don't want to do a full breakdown of everything because there's frankly not enough time. But I do want to give you kind of a few quick examples, again, taken from recent court cases to just kind of kind of get you thinking about how this is going to work. So if we look at libraries, for one, something I mentioned before, and I'll very briefly cover it here. So libraries, I don't think anybody is seriously going to contend this side of if you have a master's in library science that, look, you know, um, this is the heartland of government authority. This is where the, this is, this is the heart. This is the cardiac center of what it is to be a core government function, because that's what the government, that's what the U.S. Supreme Court is really functioning on. I mean, they specifically said legislative assemblies and courthouses. All right. That's about as core government function as you can get. Likewise, perhaps by extension, polling, which is, of course, where the rubber, one of the places where the rubber hits the road as far as citizens participating in government. There's also jury boxes and so forth. If you're going to rule in libraries and say, well, look, it's government property, then, of course, the it's government property argument just extends almost to infinity because we're talking about virtually every road, every highway, uh, again, every bus stop. In many different states, of course, the government owns huge tracts of land, forests, parks, you name it, right? And we're going to get to parks in a moment because I know that that's going to be a big deal for many of you, okay? The government's saying, look, no, 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 libraries, in this particular case that came out recently, uh, said, no, libraries, no, we're, we're at, that's, that's a bridge too far. We're not going to be going there, all right? We cannot confuse the ownership of land by the government as being the same thing as the heartland of core civic function. Different things. But I want to take a moment to talk about parks because this actually gets kind of interesting and I'm going to give you some, some examples on this. All right. So there was a recent case uh, which I actually talked about and we'll link it in the description box below if you want to see more in-depth uh, facts and analysis on that. But there was a recent case which actually did pull apart the historical regulation of parks. And the court wrestled with it. And they said, look, there is somewhat of a historical tradition of regulation of parks. Here's what they got through. Just again, so you can get an idea as to how this judicial analysis, how this constitutional analysis is going to wind up taking place. So the court observed in this case that, look, there are some locations that actually go back to the 1800s when it comes to the regulation of possession and carry of firearms in parks. Um, but they also noted that this, this was mainly in densely populated urban centers, like, for instance, New York City, where firearms were banned in Central Park Ordinance back in 1861. Now, I'm curious if any of you know out there whether or not this had to do with possibly protests against Civil War drafts or draft riots or something like that. But just the same, we do have an 1861 law coming from New York City banning the possession of firearms in Central Park. Specifically, it's said to carry firearms or to throw stones or other missiles within the park. So that's kind of what made me wonder. I wonder if this is a draft riot thing, of course, going along with the year. Philadelphia, likewise, in Fairmount Park, where it prohibited in the acts of assembly relating to Fairmount Park 
1870 that no person shall carry firearms or shoot birds in the park or within 50 yards thereof or to throw stones or missiles therein. Likewise, we also see in St. Louis, Missouri in 1881, Chicago, Illinois, also 1881, St. Paul, Minnesota, 1888, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1893. So there's definitely some laws going back there, particularly to the 1800s, but at a minimum, the laws cannot be overly broad to include areas that are not densely populated urban centers, according to the court that was doing this analysis. Again, these are all major metropolitan areas, even back then, albeit to varying degrees. And we also cannot conflate that some city parks are out there with entire country of parks. This is what a particular legislature did when they tried to ban the possession of firearms at every single park in the entire state. And the court correctly pointed out an observed look. Let's not confuse the fact that a couple targeted laws at a couple very specific parks in a few major metropolitan areas is not at all the same thing as banning the possession and carry of firearms in every single park across the entire state, no matter how rural or how suburban or anything like that. Completely different things. So once more, we cannot lose sight of the fact that just because there was once a law banning the possession at a particular sensitive location, in this particular place, a park, that that doesn't mean that it lacks any context, which is going to be extremely important. The contextual clues are going to be extremely important when we get to constitutional analysis of whether or not something falls within the strike zone of the Second Amendment or outside and therefore it can be regulated. Laws that are also, again, overly broad by putting restrictions on the carry of firearms within a thousand feet of a park could effectively outlaw the carry in entire cities. So there was actually a case back in 2018, I think it was offhand. So there's actually an Illinois case from 2018. Let me know if you want me to go more into this in the comment section below, which banned not only the carry in Chicago's 600 parks, but also you cannot be within, as I recall, a thousand feet of any of those parks as well. And of course, the operative effect of this was basically that it outlawed any kind of carry whatsoever in Chicago. There was also a former politician, bonus points if you can name them, who I believe once proposed, and I can't recall if it was a debate or if it was something that was actually legislative, uh, the banning of any uh, firearm stores or FFLs within five miles of a school, which of course would likewise effectively ban um, stores from virtually any metropolitan area whatsoever. And I mean, that's that's going to put things out in the middle of nowhere. It, again, these contextual clues are extremely important to kind of teasing apart what's going to be lawful, what's going to be unlawful. One last example of actually a park regulation law that got struck down in a case called Bridgeville Rifle and Pistol Club v. Small, which came from Delaware in 2017. The court ruled in that case that under Delaware's constitution, so this is pre the Bruin decision, that the state's designation of public parks as gun-free zones did not just infringe but destroyed the core right of self-defense for ordinary citizens. That's a paraphrase, but it, it's an accurate paraphrase. So where might some of this stuff be going? Well, I'm going to point out that, of course, in 1972, you had the law banning possession of firearms in post offices and postal property. Curiously, we also have, of course, the ban from Congress in 1961 concerning the accessible firearms on airplanes. What do you think of the comment section is going to happen in a post bruin world when it comes to just those two laws? What other laws do you want to see us talk about? And including, if you want, of course, a longer in-depth video. I really want to get to a big thing, though, which is the private property inversion. And I really don't know a better way of putting it. But again, this is where the government sets the default setting of private property as being, nope, it's all illegal unless you opt in. We've seen this as a common playbook tactic in a handful of states and down the stretch of 2022 and into 2023. So what does the court had to say anything about this? And again, before I touch in on this, please just take a moment. Click like, subscribe. It helps our, our channel and our video grow and get out there. Show your support for the Second Amendment, of course, by doing so as well and onwards. But guys, there's something really important and kudos if you made it this far because this is going to be a really big thing that we have seen post Bruin legislatures who are hostile to the Second Amendment take steps to do, which is what I call the private property inversion. And I really need to come up with something better than PPI, but private property inversion, but here it is. In a nutshell, this is what I teased right at the front end of, look, private property, the legislatures are setting it, everything's being illegal unless you explicitly opt in or if you're in like a gun store or a target range. And we actually already had one court deal with that. What the court pointed out was, look, couple things. Number one, sure, the US Supreme Court commented about the fact that, yes, your need and your right to self-defense is absolutely most acute in the home. It's at its highest in the home, but it is by no means 
invisible elsewhere once you leave the home. It does not end when you leave the home. Crime and tyranny does not exist strictly in your home, hypothetically. It can also exist outside the home, absolutely. So the Second Amendment does not apply to one particular place inside property, property inside your home. It does not apply to a particular gun range or a particular FFL, a particular gun store, Federal Farms Licensed Dealer, FFL. It applies everywhere because everybody's at danger everywhere. And of course, the court went on to note the fact that, look, if we only made it apply on private property and allowed the government to regulate all public property, half the amendment struck down. I also just want to throw in there kind of a little bit of my two cents that, you know, why is the government regulating the default position of a constitutional amendment on private property? Why is the default position off? If it should be anything, the default position should be on, just like, and I always like to bring this back to kind of someone jokingly called in a common field once the Tom Grief First Amendment test. Apparently, I'm one of the only people who does this. Um, if there's others, I'm sorry. But uh, again, I'm just going off the comment field. And we all know that YouTube comment fields are 100% correct. The Tom, the Tom Grief First Amendment test is, I like to compare Second Amendment regulation to First Amendment regulation. And if can you imagine if you were not allowed to have free speech, if you're not allowed to express, it doesn't even matter if it's a political opinion or religious opinion or or just any opinion. You're not allowed to express any opinions if you go to a friend's house unless they give you explicit permission first. You're not allowed to express any opinion if you are on a public road, on a public sidewalk or anything like that because that is the exact treatment that these legislators are giving the second amendment if we translate the second to the first. That's what they're doing. Moreover, of course, good luck trying to find the historical analysis, the historical tradition to support that. So there's so much more I could have gotten into here, but again, I really want to keep this as short a video as possible. I know I kind of struggle bus hard on that sometimes at baseline, but I really want to make sure you guys get high effort content that brings you through the way things actually work, not low effort videos, high effort videos. So if there's something else you want to see me do a, a much deeper dive on, maybe a particular location, other portions of the Second Amendment, other portions of the Bruin decision or something else, let me know in the comment field below. I absolutely take your comments as strong advice of what I should be doing. Again, please share your support for the channel as well as the Second Amendment. Click like, subscribe. I look forward to reading your comments. And as always, I will see you in the next one. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, you might like some of the other content that we've been up to recently. Please feel free to check out these other videos. We'll see you in the next one.